Today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. My pleasure to welcome back to the show uh, my guy Spiro Ditas. Last time he was on, uh, he was on as TNT NBA play-by-play man. Now CBS NFL play-by-play man. Uh, the, the fantastic double that he does. He's got the commanders this weekend in Denver. Spiro, welcome back to the show, man. Craig, good to hear your voice and uh, and good to be back. St- uh, things have changed with this franchise since the last time we spoke. No doubt. And ironically, though, I do think the last time you were on, we had you on when you were calling Phoenix, Denver. That just hit me. So the fact that you're going to be back in Denver this weekend, apparently every time you go, you wind up on the show. <laughs> I am your Denver beat reporter. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who it's thought? an honor. It's an um, honor. So when you when you see this team from the outside um, and you kind of take this this you come in for the weekend and, and that's what you guys do on, on the national play by play front and, and you interact with the team. I know at this point of the week, it's not been as much, especially for a road team. You won't really get to see them until the weekend. But just what you're hearing, you know, what the vibe is, what the buzz is around the league compared to what it has been previously. Like how different is the experience even even to a Thursday in a game week for you? Yeah, night and day, night and day getting ready for this team. And and we, we've we done a, a good number of Washington games over the past couple of years, uh, going back to Ron's first year there. And I always got the sense that that you were just kind of walking on eggshells in that building. You know, there was a tension. There was just always something bubbling beneath the surface. And we get we have the privilege of going to facilities around the NFL and it's it's so different from team to team from franchise to franchise you know the the operations that are perennially in a good place at the top of the league the vibe in those buildings is so different and you know just to take my broadcaster hat on and and just to speak from a fan's perspective i i grew up in the northeast i was a giants fan growing up i mean to me the Washington franchise was synonymous with with success and first class and 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 all of the good things that you strive to be as an NFL franchise. And for that to go away for as long as it did, I just you know it, obviously it 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 sucked if you were a fan of the franchise. Um, but just from afar, the league is better when Washington is is in its usual perch. You know, uh, I grew up watching the Joe Gibbs teams and you know, the hogs and Daryl green and, and just hall of fame players and, and just a a first class organization. So I think the fact that they've turned that corner and that black cloud is no longer hanging above this franchise. This is a, this is a a season, no matter what the win loss record is at the end that, you know, if you're a fan of the commanders, if you've been a fan of this franchise for a long time, just enjoy this moment. And then, you know, you, you have to put your faith in the front office now that over the next year, two, three years, they're going to make the decisions to uh, to get this uh, team to continue its climb up the NFC. So one of the things that uh, you, know, you mentioned, Ron, talk, or kind of being on eggshells and people around the building being on eggshells, he obviously had to cover for so much. And, you know, there it's, it's always an interesting conversation around here with him because there's certainly like generic run of the mill head coach criticism. Then there's also mm-hmm. in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, yeah, he had cancer and he's had to deal with this terrible owner and the DEA raided the facility. Like there's been all this nonsense <laughs> that he's had to deal with. But Gosh, I um, forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I actually did too till the other day till Fitzpatrick brought it up with uh, with Kevin Clark on his show. Um, and I was like, oh, right. They got raided by the DEA and didn't have trainers for half the year. Yeah. Um, yeah. But w- when you I don't know if you had the chance to talk to him about Howell yet at all or what you anticipate, but uh, when you talked to him last year about Carson, and we had this conversation with Adam Amin, who called the game for Fox Week 1 last week, and he said the conversation about Howell versus the conversation about Wentz was completely different. That with Wentz, it was like Ron was saying all the right things, but if you read his body language, like there was clearly nerves there. And again, I don't know how much you've had a chance to talk to them at all this week, but I'm curious if you remember any conversations last year with Ron about Wentz and then kind of, you know, mentally preparing what it'll be like to talk to him about how and what you've seen in terms of press clippings, et cetera, press conferences throughout the spring and summer uh, about this year's quarterback. Yeah, we we haven't met with them yet. We're going to sit down with them at their hotel once they get into Denver on Saturday, and we're all looking forward to that. And I'm I'm just looking forward to seeing what what his demeanor is like. And obviously, we've been listening to his press conferences and, and following the team from afar. But I, I can't speak to we we had Washington. I want to say early last year. I'm not I can't remember exactly which week, but you did get the sense that very early in that marriage between Wentz and the franchise, 
that they got the feeling very quickly that he was not going to be the answer. And some of that was based on track record. Obviously, his his status, his stock had fallen to such a um, an incredibly low point to where the margin for error for Carson Wentz just was was very very small. And you know, Ron is a loyal guy. He's been through a ton in his personal life, as you just alluded to. And and the one thing you love about him is that he's always going to go to bat for his guys. You know, whether. He believes that deep down. Um, only he can answer that. But I, I don't think there's any doubt that early last year, they they kind of got the feeling that it just wasn't going to work out. And they were stuck in this no man's land of of searching for a quarterback and somewhere that the franchise has been for for a very long time, you know, basically since Kirk Cousins walked out the door. So it, completely different vibe now with this kid. I, I think they, they just made an organizational decision after – swinging for the fences a little bit the last couple of years. Obviously, there was some interest in Russell Wilson. Uh, great story today in the Washington Post. Um, yeah, a couple of years ago, Ryan Fitzpatrick worked a little bit and the injuries. Now they've made the decision, we're going to invest in a kid that we we drafted. Um, a pretty good value pick for a fifth rounder, you know, based on what he did uh, his second year at North Carolina. And, and I think they're all in on this kid. And this is, you know, from just from a fan's perspective, if I'm a fan of the team, this is what I want. You've got a very motivated offensive coordinator, associate head coach, and Eric Bieniemy, who we all know has a ton to prove, clearly wants to be a head coach in this league, and he knows that he, if he can get this kid Sam Howell to perform at a level that puts Washington in postseason contention this year, automatically he's in the mix potentially for, for a head job next year and certainly within the next couple of years. So you've got a motivated staff. You've got a kid who's got some some nice traits. And, and now let's see how far uh, they can take this thing together. Spiro Didis, CBS with us. He'll be on the call this weekend. Commanders and Broncos kickoff is at 425. Set your, uh, set your reminders accordingly. Uh, he's with us, of course, for Not My Beat today. So... Um, you mentioned the enemy. I'm sure at some point over the last, I don't know, he's been, he was there for a decade. You've been calling games a long time. You had to have had him at least a couple of times over the years when he was mm. the OC and had a chance to meet with him. What's, what's always kind of your, your conversation like with the enemy and, and what can you tell us about what he's like behind closed doors? Love talking to him. You know, he's, he's such a, he's such a football guy. He's so bright. Um, but he, he just, you know, he's one of those guys that has the chip on his shoulder. And I think as, as the last couple of years have materialized and he, thought he was going to you know he was he was the the darling kind of coaching candidate and to be sitting here in 2023 and he still hasn't gotten that opportunity you can imagine you know the the size of that chip only gets bigger and so you know we we've always enjoyed uh, chatting with him but i i do think that that this is you know this is now his shot i mean there there's nowhere else to hide you know if he can you know, he's the play caller. I know he he hasn't appreciated some of the line of questioning of, of the fact, is he calling plays for the first time? He, he clearly stated that he has and did uh, for certain stretches in Kansas City. But be that as it may, you know, this is now his show. And uh, everyone knows that he's the guy. You know, he has taken the reins of this offense. And, you know, he doesn't have Patrick Mahomes anymore. He doesn't have Andy Reid next to him anymore. Let's see what you can do now. And and I, I think the competitor in Eric Bieniemy likes this. You know, would he like to be a head coach in 2023? Absolutely. But this is the reality of the situation. I think it's a really good opportunity for him to prove to the league and to prove to the owners who have passed him over for jobs that he is indeed worthy of a head job at some point. And, and this is what you love about sports. I mean, you know, there's no excuses anymore. Let's see what you can do with a kid who, again, fifth round pick isn't, you know, uh, you know, top high draft pick, um, does have some shortcomings. Can you mold this kid to perform at a level that gives your team a chance at the playoffs, that gives your team a chance at a division championship? That's what we're going to find out here over the next couple of weeks and next few months. I want to circle back uh, to some of the bigger, more obvious storylines with Denver in a second. But if I'm not mistaken, your broadcast partner's out, Art Adam Archuleta, right? Mm -hmm. uh, have that correct. Uh, who was a, he was pretty good as a safety back in the day. Uh, and you guys have had Denver uh, before, and and I'm sure he's had a chance. You guys have had a chance to talk about Justin Simmons, and that's sure. a name that we haven't mentioned probably enough on the show this week. Is I mean, I guess we're kind of really starting our Denver stuff today, but 
that guy is ridiculously good and he's a name because he plays in Denver that I don't know that everybody knows. But as you talk with Adam and, and observe yourself, uh, what Justin Simmons means to that defense, uh, what kind of challenge does he present for, for Bianca Mihal and this commander's offense? Well, I think Justin's, I couldn't agree with you more. I think he's one of the more underrated players at his position. You know, the guy's been an all pro, uh, not just a pro bowl, but an all pro each of the last right. three years. I mean, you know, the, the guys at that position that have done that um, are few and far between. So in and of himself, I think he's an elite talent. Now, suddenly you put him in the, def in the same defensive backfield um, as a kid like Pat Sertan, and suddenly, you know, he goes to an even higher level. You know, Justin Simmons and Sertan, that's a pretty good cornerback duo. And, you know, now suddenly you got to stay away from Sertan. And so Simmons last year, I thought, took took advantage of it. And then some, you know, career high six interceptions, I think tied him for the league lead last year. And, you know, he's just one of those guys that is so versatile. He's got a great frame at his position. And and Arch loves those kind of players, you know, that, that have the long arms and, and uh, rangy guys that can cover a ton of distance. And. You know, it's another reason why I think, you know, all the conversation in Denver has been about Sean Payton, you know, can he get Russell Wilson right? That defense, I, I think, if they can figure out the pass rush, which is a little bit of an issue for them, they've got some pieces back there. And and they're one of those teams that can go from the bottom to potential contention in the span of a year very quickly if they can figure some things out on both sides of the ball. But Simmons, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. One of the best at his position and and very, very underrated. Then you get to kind of the obvious stories. Aspiro Ditas is our guest. CBS Sports play-by-play -play man will be on the call this weekend. And I'm curious as you even put together kind of your storyboard for the game, that the headliney type of stuff. How much do you talk about the Russell Wilson Washington connection and that that article that Sam Fortier wrote in the Washington Post, and you know that that they tried to go after him. That Sean Payton has made some comments about, oh, uh, there was an ownership group that is potentially getting involved and everyone was pretty sure that it was the Josh Harris group that had talked to him while he was still at Fox and Ron Rivera had to answer those comments. Do any of those kind of, I don't want to call them, I don't want to lead the witness and call them ancillary, but do any of those storylines make the the broadcast prep, if you will? I, I think potentially. And, and, you know, look, Russell Wilson was the number one quarterback on the market. So, you know, this, this narrative that, you know, it was a bad thing or it's some kind of slight to Sam Howell or, or anyone else within the Washington franchise, I think is silly. I mean, obviously they had an interest in Russell Wilson, didn't work out. You know, he had a short list of teams that he was interested in going, had his no, no, no trade clause, and he ended up in Denver. But as, as it was alluded to in that piece today, I think based on what happened last year with Russell Wilson in Denver, and based on the draft capital and the King's ransom that they had to give up to get Wilson, I'm... I don't think I'm very upset with where I'm at if I'm a fan of the commanders, you know, based on what they did with those picks that they were able to keep and and based on some of the potential that I think you see with Sam Howell. Now, it's it's obviously very early. We don't know who this kid is, what his ceiling is as a quarterback. But for a franchise that had so many holes and so many needs I just I'm I'm never a fan of giving up so much in terms of draft capital uh, in the NFL. You know those picks are so valuable, and you know now that's why I think you make the big bet on an Eric Bieniemy to come in and to mold this kid because if you can get out of him some of what you were hoping to get out of a Russell Wilson and a guy of his ilk at the quarterback position, then you've really got something. So. You know, it was a gamble that I think they made as a franchise, and and now we'll have to wait and see. But certainly, it's a storyline. We've got a Didi Kinkabwala who's as well connected in this league as anyone. You know, she's talking to all the executives this week and the coaches, and I'm sure we'll have some of those story storylines during the course of the game. Yeah, I would go as far as to say that even if Sam doesn't work out, not having given up that draft capital is probably the best outcome for Washington, considering I agree. where Russ yeah. is. Um, and you trust the enemy to pick, you know, assuming that everyone doesn't get blown out after the year with which new ownership, who knows, um, you know, you, you trust the enemy to pick the next guy um, or whoever you hire to pick the next guy. And, and you know, that's been kind of the. You know, if you want a, a bonus sport storyline, Sparrow, just spoon, spoon feeding you here. Like the <laughs> thing that's been crazy about Washington with the quarterback stuff is they've never really had a coach quarterback alignment where, you know, going back to, to 
Griffin is kind of forced upon them. Like the Shanahan wanted him. They didn't want to give up the price, sure. but they also draft cousins because they know like this is a pretty high risk deal. Then they get blown out. Gruden inherits cousins. Cousins winds up leaving because of mess with the front office. Gruden then gets Haskins forced upon him. Uh, Gruden gets fired. Rivera comes in, has to try to play Dwayne for a year, and obviously that doesn't wind up working out. And obviously uh, the tragedy has since happened with Dwayne, but from a pure football standpoint, like there's no alignment there. And so, you know, you'd hope that eventually there's a coach and a quarterback that actually picked each other, so to speak, that, that mm -hmm. can be developed here. Uh, but, you know, they, they have that's the chance great, to do that. That's they, a great if, point. Yeah. It's just it's just a byproduct, I think, of, of organizational dysfunction. And when you've, you know, when you've had a rotation, a, a carousel of head coaches and GMs and, and all the ownership issues that they've had there, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it comes with the territory, unfortunately. But again, I, I think there, there's light at the end of the tunnel and, you know, they didn't give up a ton to get this kid fifth round pick. They're kind of playing with house money right now. And so I, I like where they are, especially after what we've seen there the last decade plus, who knows how many years. Agreed. Uh, last thing for you on the way out in my, uh, my long diatribe there actually just ticked this off in my brain and we go full circle back to your NBA roots as well. I should have mm -hmm. asked you about Josh Harris first. I'm going to ask you about Josh Harris last. Like you've watched him work in Philadelphia as the owner of the 76ers. What do you take from his ownership in Philly and what he's done there that you think is applicable to what he will do with a football team here? I, I don't think it's hard. I mean, I, I just think that the the best owners and look, we've seen the brash owners have success. The Jerry Joneses, you know, all these guys that that love the spotlight. But to me, I've always been a fan of the owner who spends the money hires the right people and just gets out of the way, you know, lets these people perform and do the job that they've been brought in to do. Doesn't meddle, you know, isn't around day to day. Um, I did like that. He went down to the locker room last week and a really cool moment between him and Ron Rivera with the game ball, but you could just tell, and, and I've heard this talking to people around the 76ers that, you know, he's not a guy that likes, loves the spotlight. He's a guy that, that um, you know, you want to play for, you want to win for, and he just has all the attributes that you want. And I, I just think, you know, look at all the alumni that showed up last week. Um, Champ Bailey hasn't been there in 100 years, and, and RG3 <laughs> and all of these guys. You know, I, I think you're, you're starting to see his impact on that franchise, on that city in a very short amount of time. And that's, again, that's why if I'm a fan – the win loss record is obviously is something you want to win this year, but just to get out from under that cloud and to have Josh Harris as your owner, whatever happens this year, it's it's a success. Um, yeah, he's he's the type of owner that you want, no doubt. Uh, and that's certainly the way a lot of people here feel. Although on game days, it doesn't always feel that way. As exactly. people are watching irrationally on Twitter and yada yada <laughs> yada. Uh, as we do, uh, all of us watching from here in the district will be hearing the voice of this man right here, Spiro Ditas. On CBS this weekend, Spiro, always a pleasure to catch up, my friend. Hopefully, uh, we got you a game in D.C. later this season and we'll get a chance to catch up in person. Until then, stay well, travel safe, and uh, thanks for coming on the show. Always a pleasure, Craig. I appreciate it. Hey, this is D.A., and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.